Hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. We have a really great episode here, but it's an entirely different swing from our more theoretical one with the Constitution DAO. Folks, if you haven't checked that episode out yet, be sure to go see what happens. The auction is at 6.30 Eastern tonight, so a lot of interesting things will come from this. We are speaking with Tim Marshall. He is the author of The Power of Geography. He's also written The Age of Walls and Prisoners of Geography, among other things. He is a person who looks at the world through the lens of geopolitics. This is about how do we think about how the sea with China and Taiwan affects things? How do we think about the border between India and Pakistan and China and how that shapes conflict in these countries? How are we gonna see mass migration fueled by the desire to be more prosperous, things like climate change? So many different questions are gonna really come about. Sagar, what interested you in this conversation? Yeah, I mean, people here know that we're kind of you know junkies for history. And one of the things that I hate most about so much of the talk, topics today is the idea that we've left history behind. And as Tim alludes to with the Mark Twain quote, quote, history does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And one of the things that's rhymed throughout human history is geography, physical you know, location of actual states and land and how that fixes and changes the way that different powers interact. But the thing that's overlaid on top of that is the internet is the modern problems of the 21st century. So this episode is all about how does geography, the internet, space, how does it all collide in the context of the US and China, of our relationships with Japan, of the United Kingdom, of how is the world actually gonna look like when you have two decentralizing factors, like a futuristic factor of the internet and technology and of the, of the newness of the global economy combined with land. God's not making any more of it. So I think it's a very interesting point. Really well said. Well, you all know the deal. This is a show that loves to hawk books. You can follow the link to our bookshop. It's in the show notes. I actually got a quick note on this. People were saying, where do we find the bookshop? We searched realignment. It is in the show notes right below you on YouTube or on the actual podcast episode. You would buy Tim's book, help support the show and local independent booksellers. Number two, it's Thursday. That means that we have a sub stack going out. As we said last week, when we were writing about well, how should the audience participate more, we got some really, really awesome audience responses. I'm going to actually feature one of them write a bit about topics we covered this week. Lots of great stuff. You can subscribe to the Substack below as well too. It's the realignment.substack.com. Last but not least, huge thank you to Lincoln Network for supporting our work. If you are listening to the audio version of this introduction, Lincoln Network is launching a fellowship and looking at technology policy issues through the lens of competition in the 21st century. It's called the Facet Fellowship. There's a link to that as well. I did a quick interview with Tom Khalil. He is at Smith Futures. They are co-sponsoring this uh, fellowship. So if you'd like to learn more about a way to get engaged in these technology and competition issues through the lens of foreign policy, STEM, economics, stick to the end of the episode on the audio version. We have a quick 10-minute interview there. Lots of great stuff. Let's get into this amazing episode. Tim Marshall, welcome to The Realignment. Uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's an honor to be, uh, to be invited by you two, so thank you. Good. Great to see you, Tim. No, thank you. So let's start by defining terms. Your book is looking at the world through a geopolitical lens, focusing, again, on geography. Can you define these terms and how they shape your approach to the foreign policy questions we're looking at here? Sure. Uh, I mean, geopolitics, there are different theories about what it actually means. My version is that it does look mostly at the relationship between states, but through a geo graphic lens insofar, that's the starting point. So if I want to understand country X, I start by looking at its physical geography, its human geography, where are its people, where are its borders, where are its rivers, which direction do they flow in? And when I've got a grasp of that, and then you build on and look at the history of that country, you'll see a lot of the history falling into place, not because geography is destiny, there are uh, you know, uh, many other factors in play. But when you have that geographic framing, then a lot of the things that have happened within that frame make sense. So then finally, when you put on the current affairs, what is happening right now? 
what is happening on the Belarusian-Polish border, for example, a lot of things come into much better focus. So that, that's my version of geopolitics. Some other people actually have taken more of the geography out of it. I'm trying to put it back in. I think geography is extraordinarily important. One of the things that you write about in the book is that the geographic problems of the 20th century are not going to be the geographic problems of the 21st century. So that's two questions, obviously. Number one, what were the geographic mm -hmm. problems of the 20th century? Uh, and then what are the ones in the 21st century going to look like and how do they substantially differ? Well, some of them will be the same. I mean, one of the lines I, I often go out with is that the Himalayas are still going to be there, as far as we know. <laughs> but the Himalayas were, in the previous century, simply a barrier between two great powers, which did indeed separate them, and is probably almost certainly the primary reason why they never fought each other, India, China, but apart from the brief skirmish in the 1970s. But new technology and uh, cyber warfare and the fact that both have grown blue water navies um, and the fact that they are now able to reach each other in greater numbers due to building of roads means that there's now a new... You need to concentrate more on that incredibly high ground, which previously you didn't have to focus on because they couldn't reach each other. But also now that they've grown blue water navies, I believe China and India, if they do clash, are more likely to clash at sea. Hmm. So there's one, one, one example. Uh, I mean, I, I do think that many of the, pre, the existing geographic fault lines will continue. But again, whereas Europe was the dominant focus and center of the world almost, in, in uh, geopolitical terms due to the Cold War and it being on the front line. In the 21st century, that shifted right across because the center of the world now, in geopolitical terms, is Indo-Pacific uh, and Europe less so. So it's, it's just in, in, you know, the, the, the geography is obviously still there, but the focus and importance of which regions do change. And when you think of this idea of geographic problems in the 20th century, you should obviously think of Germany. So much of the first half and actually even the second half, you think of West and East Germany were about resolving Germany's place in Europe, a, a question that was solved at, you know, more than 80 to 100 million deaths in, yeah. in both wars, and then a possible nuclear armed Cold War going yeah. forward there. If we're thinking then of the 21st century, what is the equivalent of the German problem that Ooh. could see a high amount of tension? And would really, if you were to think about in 2100, what is the geographic region that will tell the story of this century? Well, yeah, Indo-Pacific. I mean, and it's not that, that, I mean, I've already made the case that that, that is, you know, the equivalent of, of the epicenter of the 20th century, the 21st century epicenter for me, without doubt, is the Indo-Pacific. I mean, the center of the center uh, is the South China Sea. Now, it's not an exact comparison with Germany and the German question, but Taiwan is key to this because <clears throat> it, so much about what is going on is also about Taiwan. When China looks out, into the world, it sees in front of it a wall built of Japan, one or two of the small South Korean islands, Taiwan is the biggest brick in this wall, uh, Philippines, Malaysia, Malacca Strait, Indonesia, etc. It's in front of them. And in naval terms can easily be blockaded. You know, you've got you guys have got 11 aircraft carrier groups. It's easy. You could, as things stand, blockade China. You can block the uh, Malacca Strait, and you can choke them, and their economy would die. Existential threat for them. I'm not saying you're about to do that, but countries don't operate on what you're about or not about to do. It's what you might be able to do. If you take that big, biggest brick out, Taiwan, 
the way is free for the uh, Chinese to get out there and dominate what's called the first island chain. So for me, it's the key. And it's the key not just for that physical uh, element, it's a psychological element as well. Let's say, theoretically, China did uh, threaten to and then invaded Taiwan, and, and they would take it. Uh, it would take a few days and possibly a few years of guerrilla war, but without American help, they would take it. At that point, not only is China now uh, in a better position to push way out into the Pacific, but all of your allies in that region, South Korea, would start to think, ah, we've, we've hedged our bets a little bit. Our weight has always been uh, with one foot China, one foot the States, but most of the weight towards the States, that would change. If you don't back Taiwan, that will change. Even Japan would start to think, we better start kowtowing to China, bending to their will. Philippines would go like that. Other countries, because what, what choice would they have um, if, if, if they feel America cannot be trusted? And so that's another reason why Taiwan is just this, this key in this, this bigger um, area. Taiwan would allow you know, the, the Chinese to dominate, utterly dominate the South China Sea. And if they dominate the South China Sea, say that it is their territorial waters and then enforce what would then follow from that, that you then have to ask for permission to do certain things in what are now international sea lanes, the other international sea lanes are at risk. So for me, the key uh, in all of that is Taiwan. So I think what is fascinating in the Taiwan question and more, we've been thinking a lot here in previous China episodes about World War I and keeping with the Germany example. What, if anything, from the geographic questions of the First World War, can we learn here in terms of avoiding a conflict with China? So I can already hear the skepticism in a lot of people's voices. Tim, Taiwan, we acknowledge in the United States a one China policy. Our own president, Joe Biden, yeah. said that yesterday. He said, we will still believe in one China, which means tacitly we agree Taiwan is not a real country. The Taiwan Defense Act says we have to provide them with means to defense. Nobody said anything about affirmatively like engaging U.S. soldiers. Yeah. Whereas Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and others, we don't have outright defense agreements, but we have tens of thousands of American soldiers there. Yes. An attack on them would be constitutionally, and I mean that not in like the American Constitution way, but more like dispositionally completely different from that. So. Is it not then a lesson of the First World War that drawing extremely clear red lines around what is permissible and what is not would decrease the likelihood of conflict? I'm just pushing back a little bit and want to get your perspective. Well, I, I don't disagree with you okay. uh, necessarily. Yeah. Um, but it, it is, that is a red flag. Um, I, I mean, I think Biden, he did say that yesterday, but a couple of weeks ago, he actually went a bit further than that. And oh, yeah. Strongly right. that they, you would go to their yes. defence. And the White House then immediately said, well, actually, nothing, nothing right. has changed. Which was now, worse, in uh, my opinion. Yeah, yeah that's, <laughs> like, well, that's, yeah. One of, that's one of two things going on, the one right. about two weeks ago. Yeah. It's either they thought it out and Biden goes out there and says it to make the Chinese start second guessing, oh, you know, they're going to be tough on this. Uh, but then obviously have to revert, oh, no, well, no, nothing has changed, but they've sent the signal, that's one. And the other one, uh, I'm more I'm reluctant, but, I, you know, Mr. your president does appear to be increasingly tired. And, you know, not all of his sentences yeah. join up. So it could have been that. Either way, yeah, I... I to your wider point about clear red lines. <clears throat> With Japan, yes, they're a treaty ally, as far as I remember. <laughs> With Taiwan, I don't see the point of creating that, that incredibly strong red line, which if and when mistakes are made, or if there's ambiguity in what China then does, I think you can trip that wire. 
Um, I think I think strategic ambiguity on the Taiwan question, uh, uh, but with strong hints, <laughs> and and more importantly, in the event that the build-up came, because this you know this would be you would see it coming weeks and weeks in advance, and it's a six-hour crossing anyway. At that point, you have to move assets very quickly between the two entities. Right. That sort of strong signal I'd, I'd be with you on, but I, I, I think you might be creating extra, dan- extra dangers. So and, and at the very beginning when you started to ask that, one, you said, what, what lessons do we work, learned? Two from World War I. One is well known, and that is don't get yourself into these tripwire alliances where you have to, but the one that most people don't remember is that it was argued strongly before World War I that Britain and Germany, because they, their industrial power had grown so much and they had so many economic links, you know, early globalization, you call it, they couldn't possibly fight each other because it would ruin their economies. I don't think that's a strong argument. Um, they I, weren't I wrong. They did ruin both, but yeah, it's <laughs> they a did break. <laughs> it's a break on conflict, sure. Uh, but I don't yeah. think it, it's a, a block on conflict. Yeah, I'm thinking again in the World War One. You know, your your own country, um, how you, they got drawn into the First World War was ambiguity around Belgium, as in there was no real, you know, there was no real policy or forthright message from the British government around Belgian neutrality which led the Germans to conclude, well, you know, we can do it and we'll probably get away with it. Obviously, yeah. a very foolish and dumb decision. Um, that's kind of the context in which I'm thinking about the Taiwan question, where ambiguity almost seemed to draw Britain mm-hmm. into the First World War, creating a disaster on all fronts. Yeah, so, so where, I'm, where I'm with you halfway mm-hmm. is that, yes, clear signaling, where I, I, I won't go as far as, as, as to say that thick red line, which which requires the overturning of the one country uh, policy. It's better just to park that. But yeah, strong signaling, strong signaling. And, you know, I I think there's a little bit of that going on. Um, I don't know if you saw last month the joint naval exercises. Um, Well, the Canadians joined in, in the Sea of Japan. Mm -hmm. The Dutch Navy, you know, I mean, don't, you know, I know it's a small country, but the fact is that a, a European modern navy bothered to go all the way around there and join its boats. I love saying that because navy people hate that. Because they <laughs> their ships. Join its boats up to the other boats there. Um, the Japanese were there, the Australians were there, and the Americans were there. So, so, but a key thing happened. It didn't make very many headlines. A fixed-wing aircraft landed on a Japanese aircraft carrier. They call them Big Deck ships because they were not supposed to have aircraft carriers they did they got four of them and they took off again that hasn't happened since 1945 wow that tells you what's going on there that and the chinese will have noted noted that and the chinese will have noted that japan is building four proper aircraft carriers to have eight so I, i actually think that now there is this more robust uh approach to containing uh, China, and you saw the British aircraft carrier was down there. You know, you don't need our aircraft carrier, you've got plenty of your own. But we were just saying to you, don't worry, it's okay, guys, we're here as well. Something I'm thinking about is an argument you pointed out at the start of the episode, which is about the idea of geography being destiny. And if I'm thinking back to pushback we've gotten from folks around Taiwan issues, it's look, liberal democracy is great. Taiwan is great, but at the end of the day, this is right next to China. Mm -hmm. By definition, that almost means that at some level, a Chinese acquisition, invasion, positive or negative, whether or not that's Taiwan saying they want to rejoin, whether it's being forced to join, is inevitable. But at the same time, I think back to another 20th century issue, which is still going on, but with the stakes much lower, Cuba. Cuba is actually much closer to the United States than um, Taiwan is to China. The U.S. was actively trying to overthrow the Cuban government far more aggressively than anything China is doing right now. Yet, on a variety of levels, 
geography wasn't destiny in that context. So how should we think of, or maybe it was, how should we just think well, about yeah, these um, two examples? A couple of things. Um, I'll come back to Cuba. I, I understand that view, you know, hey, why are we going to put ourselves in harm's way when Taiwan is right next to China? And there's two responses. One, um, a wussy liberal one from the likes of me, uh, which is actually not wussy we'll or liberal. <clears throat> but what are your values? You know, do you support democracy or don't you? And if you have a country that is friendly towards you, I don't care that it's just off 120 miles off the mainland of China. It's a democracy. It's your friend. You trade with it. Um, you can rely on it. Why wouldn't you want to support that democracy? You would, I, I think. The other one is, is more hard-headed, and that is uh, my argument about the sea lanes, uh, my argument about the Western Pacific. I personally believe, for all its many, many faults, forgive me, guys, but the United States is, on balance, more of a force for good in the world than a negative force in the world. It has many faults and many problems, as, does, as do all countries. I certainly think it's more, more of a benign influence in the world than the one-party state dictatorship that China is. So I don't think it's in all of our interests to um, just sit by and watch this malign one-party state dictatorship, which tortures hundreds of thousands of its citizens and locks up a million Muslim Uyghurs, et cetera, et cetera, um, dominate the entire Western Pacific and the international sea lanes and our other friends such as Malaysia and Singapore and Indonesia, etc., Japan and South Korea, other modern liberal democracies. I don't think it's a good idea. Well, well, on, on Cuba, this is where it does get difficult because it's not Robert Kagan, one of your eminent um, geopolitical writers. Um, Robert Kaplan. Kaplan, yeah, Robert Kaplan. He wrote it. <laughs> it was probably in Revenge of Geography. I think he, this is when he pointed it out, that China now looks upon the South China Sea, including Taiwan, as its, as its backyard, its sphere of influence, exactly the way the Americans looked at Cuba 120 years ago and went to war to kick Spain out of the region, and they view it in the same terms. And yeah, yeah, I understand that, but that doesn't mean that, oh, well, just because they did that, we have to let them do that. Uh, uh, I don't agree. So for both, both my um, credentials as supporting liberal democracy um, and also my rather hard-headed um, real politique, I think um, you need to stand by your friends. Because otherwise you won't have any. Right. Tim, I want to ask you about AUKUS, something I was personally really excited about. Um, for those who don't know what I'm talking about, it's the Australia, United Kingdom, mm -hmm. and U.S. kind of, I don't, for better part of a word, like almost like a triple entente alliance cooperation defense agreement yeah. meant to push back against China. Yes. The reason why I was very excited, I'm just speaking to our audience here who may not know what it is, but the reason why I was personally so excited about it is it actually felt very 19th century um, in terms of teaming up. It's the Anglosphere. You're like, you Europeans, sorry, you're mostly useless and you really can't be relied upon and you're all going to buy Huawei phones for the rest of your lives and we all know it. The three of us are really the only ones who can be <laughs> counted upon um, to actually do anything whenever push comes to shove. Sorry, France, we're selling Australia nuclear submarines. Um, you guys are friends, but you know, not that good of friends. But it did seem like a major strategic turning point to me mm. in a turn away, not necessarily that we're turning away from our NATO commitments, but from the idea of the NATO Western Hemisphere acting as a block in the hole towards Russia, it seemed that we were having a divergence in policy towards China with the Anglosphere taking the lead and the hardest point um, against the idea that we will preserve like Western primacy on the high seas in geopolitics and all of that. So I'm curious for how you can put it in historical geographic context and also just how you think about it generally, because I really think it was very important. 
Oh, it's, it's a huge deal. It's, it's huge. Not just the, you know, the, the tens of billions of dollars. And by the way, I have it on very good authority that your president was mistaken, shall we say, recently, when he said to Macron that, um, uh, you know, it was done clumsily and the French hadn't been told about it in time. It's not true. They, they were. They were told about it on the Monday, the, deep, the French Secret Service. They were so embarrassed because, you know, the Brits had been working on this for three years and the French Secret Service hadn't found out. They thought, oh dear, how are we going to tell the president we didn't know about this? And they told him on the Tuesday and then it was announced on the Thursday. He, he was, you know, he was not blindsided, you know, five with a phone call five minutes behind. I mean, Mr. Biden was a little confused on that, as far as my understanding of it is. It is historic, and it, you know, history does rhyme. Uh, sorry, it, uh, it, it doesn't repeat itself. It does rhyme, and, and I liked your summing up a bit at the beginning of that question because there is a, a, an element of that, and yes, it is based partially on that history and the Anglosphere uh, and Five Eyes. Uh, again, for yep. people that don't know um, the, the five English-speaking countries who share an intelligence gathering and sharing facility par excellence. There is nothing close to it in, in the world. And it's also true that it is a reflection on the fact that there is a feeling, certainly in the States, and America and indeed Britain, that the European militaries just do not appear willing to get their acts together, their, their governments. And so it's almost, almost inevitable. And there's the technology, because the deal was out of date. The French deal was out of date, the date they signed it in 2016. And it's part of something wider as well, which is um, also NATO, please concentrate on your... You're uh, not on out of country anymore. Afghanistan is done. We need NATO focused. And other people are going to have to focus here. And Britain is prepared to sail its carrier group halfway around the world in order to help focus and to join in with two people it absolutely trusts uh, at, at this level. Nobody else uh, we trust to that degree. And the other wider aspect is, is this, this very, very slow and, and possibly reversible decoupling of Europe from the States. Now, you mentioned why we got involved in the First World War, um, and it, uh, push comes to shove, once Belgium had gone, I mean, Britain's policy, as you know, for centuries has been to balance, and we do not want one place dominating the continent, so we got involved. And in World War II, it was the same, with, but this time it was the Americans. The Americans do not want one dominant kind of, you know, force, hence, and then the Cold War, Russia. Right. Well, there is this decoupling, um, slowly, and France is part of that. And France wants strategic autonomy for France, both economic and military. And the Britain has made its choice with Brexit, and it's chosen the open... Uh, sea lanes of the world, and it's chosen the Americans. So France is now using the AUKUS deal to push its agenda of strategic autonomy for, for, for Europe. They're now yet again talking about creating a 5,000-strong rapid reaction force out with uh, your, uh, NATO. And I'm and, and sorry, so, so to bring it all back, yes, AUKUS is symbolic of this slow divergence and this new architecture of the 21st century, which does echo back to some of the architecture of the 20th century. So it was a very uh, long-winded roundabout, uh, roundabout way to get back to where we started. <laughs> no, it's it's good. And we're, we're throwing around 19th century, 20th century, 21st century. Something you've written about in Prisoners of Geography, I think this was two books ago. I really, I really enjoyed that one. I recommend it to mm -hmm. listeners as well, too. Is the fact that we, we we really do see this post World War II 20th century order breaking down to a lot of ways, in the sense that to make it less buzzwordy and wonky, just the, the rules by which countries political parties, individuals, the, the rules by which we assumed you played 
geopolitics for the past 50, 60 years, it seems as if those rules and those orders are breaking down. And it seems to me that one of those rules was that territorial conquest was just over. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of listeners here who are going to obviously say the U.S. invaded Iraq, they invaded Afghanistan. That's obviously true. But a key thing is that no matter what you think about the Iraqi war, there was never any idea that we were going to turn Iraq into the 51st state. Um, whether or not, whether what, even in the most fevered neoconservative Democrat democracy transformational dreams, there is never an idea that the U.S. is going to occupy and conquer this country. As we're talking about this deal with Taiwan, as we're looking at something you've also written about, which is ISIS back during the height of it trying to overthrow Sykes-Picot, which was the basically post-World War I agreement of how the Middle East would look in a very colonial way, we're just seeing folks push back against the way the map was written in the 20th century. Yeah. But they're not pushing back on that in the purely diplomatic sense, but they're pushing back with conflict. This is North Sudan and South Sudan. This is conflict you're seeing in Ethiopia. So how should we just think about to the degree of which our assumption, Sagar and I as children of the 1990s, that the map was fixed and you cannot do certain things, aka take up guns and then expand your border? How should we think of that changing now? Well, you, you, you should realize that, as I'm sure you guys do, history doesn't end. Uh, and violence as a tool of policy, uh, sadly, has not ended yet. And I mean, I don't want to have too much of a pop at Francis Fukuyama. Uh, and um, He has said he was slightly misinterpreted, and I don't think he was, uh, with, with the end of history and the last man and the liberal democracy being the template that the world would embrace. I never bought that for a second because we don't have this permanency. You know, we go through different eras and there was a stability in the post second world war order, mostly brought on by the discipline of the bipolar world. You know, the Soviets clamped down on a hundred different conflicts and froze them, as did Yugoslavia, any comments there. And the American-led world also clamped down on some of the issues that that divided the Western world. Well, when you take that lid off in 1989, 1991, you emerge briefly into the period of American uh, hyperpuissance, hyperpower, as the French called it, but then when you come out of that, all those conflicts that were frozen are warming up again. And there's no discipline. You know, the, the, the Moscow cannot say to Armenia and Azerbaijan, stop it, and they'll stop. They didn't. They fought last year in a horrible, horrible war. In fact, there's been some more border clashes just in the last few days there. So I, I think it's um, a combination of many things, but mostly taking off the discipline of the Cold War all those previous issues not actually being sorted. I mean, there's one at the moment, even Bosnia in the 90s hasn't been sorted, and that is simmering away now uh, down in the Balkans. So you've got that, you've got the multipolar world, you've got America taking its eye off the ball for understandable reasons, especially after the 2008 crash. Um, And we are now reminded that in fact, history doesn't end. We are reminded that nationalism remains probably a stronger card than democracy. We are reminded very sadly that ethnicity is still, and identity is still central to our, our, our passion. And um, it's, it's all swirling around and it's very, very messy. And there's all sorts of contradictions. I mean, there's a line I use sometimes in, in talks I give about, in the absence of a world policeman, you're gonna take the law into your own hands. And that's fine. But what happens if the guy next door also wants to take the law into his own hands? And that's what's happening in many parts of the world. A great example is Greece and Turkey, which are now doing things that they probably wouldn't have been able to get away with in the uh, discipline of the Cold War. And the greatest example of that I have is that a NATO power, Turkey, has bought its missile defense system from Moscow. Can you imagine that happening in the Cold War? It's great. 
So all, you know, all that swirling around. Them, we really. put missiles in Turkey during yeah, the Cold literally. War. If you think about it. <laughs> Something Sagar and I were discussing beforehand, and this is why I really like the forward facing aspect of the power of geography, which is that we're, we're well read, we're, we're engaged. But if we were recording this conversation in 2000, aside from it not being on zoom, we would not have known how important the distinction between a Sunni and a Shia was. I would not have known that the, that the fact that Afghanistan is Pashtun and the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan is real, but also not real. These were central questions to the way the next 20 years went. We were just absolutely not aware of them in any context whatsoever. So what I'm wondering is you're thinking of the rest of the century. We're not going to be able to predict events, but what are tensions, nationalities, geographic regions, unsettled borders, problems, questions that our listeners who once again are informed, but once again, if it's 2000, there's definitely an equivalent. What are things we're going to want to think of in the next 80 years? Sure, thanks. I, I, I will come to a sh hopefully a, sh <laughs> a shortish list of them, but I'm reminded during the question uh, of, that you're right, most of us didn't know of all these divisions and these issues between areas. I mean, uh, forgive me, but it was my job to know about them. So, I, you know, I did. But, you know, I was a Middle East correspondent. I understood that, oh, this country feels this way and it's Shia. Or something. But, of course, most people don't, you know, doing other things. But it was a certain complacency that I thought in, in, in those days that violence was very old-fashioned and war, and as you said earlier, taking territory. Oh, it's all very 20th century, darling. You know, whereas, it's not because history doesn't end. You know, it's a work in progress to try to get beyond that, and we're still working on it. So, over the next, um, well, you said eighty years. Um, I'll go ten, and then out. Most people don't don't even now know where the Sahel is. The Sahel goes all over, just below the Sahara Desert. It's an Arabic word meaning shoreline. The idea is that the Sahara is the sea of sand and then the shoreline of it is where it gets slightly greener in the Sahel region, places like Mali, Niger, Chad. I'm afraid the instability down there has now spread all the way from the Red Sea right across the Atlantic. There's at least six, seven countries now involved. I would say five of them risk imploding. The Americans are there, your special forces are there, your intelligence, your drones. French have got 4,000 combat troops down there. Brits have got 400 at the invitation of the, to try to stop them imploding. If they implode, hundreds of thousands of more people will be on the move. So the Sahel region, absolutely. Um, I have a map uh, down here in front of me, happily. Sadly, I think that the middle belt of Africa is also destined to remain um, deeply, deeply unstable and also a serious place of competition because that's where a lot of the rare earth materials and, and other things that go in your iPhone are from. And so the Americans, Russians, Europeans and Chinese will continue to squabble over who can get to them uh, and therefore they will play rail politic games down there. Um, in the near just this decade, Turkey and Greece, it, it's a flashpoint because of the oil and gas that's been found. It's in Greek and Cypriot waters, but Turkey doesn't recognise the United Nations law of the sea and says half of it is theirs. It may not come to a clash, but it, it is a serious area to look at. The Central Asian republics, the stands as they're known, Tajikistan, Afghanistan and um, that there are flashpoints there and China and Russia are, are vying for influence there. Uh, so again, I'm just looking around the world here as you do. South China Sea, we've already discussed and without question for me, that's the biggest flashpoint. Uh, other areas that will, in the, well, going across from the Sahel, the Horn of North Africa, whereas Ethiopia was supposed to be the stabilizing point of a country that could grow richer, has disintegrated into civil war, and that has a knock-on effect. Sudan is, is very wobbly at the moment, uh, and then that pushes up into places like Djibouti, where you guys have a base and the Chinese have a base. Mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, I'm painting a picture of a relatively unstable world, but most of these are small wars, I hasten to add. 
Um, going up uh, beyond macro level, um, space, I mean, I have a chapter on space because uh, I'm trying to get people to think about it geographically, that it's, it's sort of another region of Earth. You know, we have a border there, and then there's this region, and within this region there are geographic areas which will be computed for and hopefully will cooperate as well. But low Earth orbit, where the satellites are, will be an area of competition. The Russians have, again, it looks like, tested. I'm not, we're not sure this time if it was a killer satellite or not, but last year they tested a killer satellite, knock out another satellite, which means everybody's going to want one of those. So I think space is here and now. Now, going way out, as you said, all, all through the century, the Asia Indo-Pacific area will be the area of um, where people bump up against each other the, the most. The Russians will continue to uh, try to reclaim what they call their near abroad. It's partly to do with what's going on in Belarus and Ukraine right now. Well, it is about that. Sorry, but if we're looking at the entire century, we must keep our eyes on the effects of climate change, which is pushing the movement of peoples um, and so you have to keep your eyes on drought, uh, water shortages, competition for water between places like Ethiopia and Egypt, between places like Turkey, Syria and Iraq. And the more that um, climate change pushes people to move, the more danger there is in some of the places they move to of conflict, which itself breeds poverty, which itself breeds movement. And so round and round we go. And the movement of people's has not peaked by any stretch of the imagination. The caravans you've seen coming up towards your border through Central America and Mexico are, have not peaked. And the people trying to come to Europe, that has not peaked either. And it is af in, uh, affecting the politics of everywhere that people go to. Uh, we, we see it in the fact that there's 80 um, far-right um, MPs in the German uh, parliament. Swedish government has, has moved extremely to the right, uh, and many other countries has, and that's going to continue to roil our, our, our politics. So, you know, that, that is the big thing of the 20th century. Climate change, movement of peoples, conflict and poverty driving, driving this movement, which is going to affect all our, all our politics. So, um, again, a very long winded. I have a question for you two. Please. If that's okay. It's delicate. Yeah, yeah. It's a delicate right. question, but I can tell I'm... Um, I can tell them with people good good uh, intent. I posited recently at a um, uh, talk that I thought there was a possibility that the United States will uh, drift across the century away from the UK because of demographics. But it's interesting what both of you have said is actually a pushback to that. I was arguing that the more you have uh, Americans who are of uh, Latin American heritage, uh, Black African heritage, uh, Asian heritage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Two examples here: the emotional and cultural pull back to the UK will diminish. And somebody pushed back at me uh, and said that that was a racist argument because the ties between us are uh, not cultural but political that were democracies, which caused me uh, some angst. Um, it, it's certainly not what I meant uh, uh, from what I was saying, because I, I do still think, I find it hard to believe that the American demographic, which has much, much less relationship back to that culture, will be as interested in it um, but perhaps you can tell me where I'm going wrong. This is, I'll take it first because, um, people probably won't recognize this, but this is actually technically a, this is a rugby shirt. Um, and this is yeah. like England yeah, 1923. Um, <laughs> and there's this brand I really like rowing blazers that does a lot of UK stuff. And, you know, I'm black, I'm African American, Sagar is Indian. So this is actually a really interesting question. I've never really thought about it before. I think the reason why you're not going to see a drift is that much as with South Korea, the UK's 
the true thing that the UK is still a superpower in is just is culture. Mm-hmm. Um, the, 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 at the end of the day, like the UK still can produce personalities. They could produce movements. This isn't just obviously referring to the, you know, pop music in the 1960s, the British invasion, um, Beatles, Rolling Stones, et cetera. But this is like Ed Sheeran. This is um, the BBC. This is, there's another Downton Abbey movie. And the reality here is that those, the things that if you're looking at the U.S. and the U.K., and I think this is the the Anglosphere's broad strength, it's that there's obviously some type of like racial basis here, mm. but the clear task that was accomplished after the end of colonialism was this was able to be transitioned beyond just a mm. pure Anglo-white idea. The parts of that that was just purely Anglo and white, I think, have largely been pushed aside, and rightfully so. Mm. And the parts that have remained are frankly, the, 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 the pop culture and also just yeah. the values. Like the, my, I don't know what you go, Sagar, but the last quick thing here is I think the big question of the century is, is like, do you believe a open system? Yeah. Is that better than a closed system? Um, do, do you believe that? Um, you sound like Hillary Clinton now, though. Yeah, well, <laughs> but once again, like, I, I don't think Hillary Clinton's completely wrong on everything, but <laughs> I think when, if we're lining up what are the big questions that we're going to have to answer as societies and cultures, the sure. U.S. and the U.K. are completely aligned on that. But yeah, sorry, uh, I'm, your... I'm, I'm interested in the other view, but uh, I actually I agree with everything you said, but I, but I still look back at history. I mean, your, your president, for example, um, Half jokingly, doesn't like the Brits because, he, as he said to the BBC once, and they said, "Oh, Mr. BBC, anyway, BBC, I'm Irish," and just walked off. You know, that, that's a cultural thing with a distance yeah. because he's Irish. And I just can't, you know, if you've got seventy percent of your population at point X in this century uh, that is not um, not even um, of European heritage, that attraction. Just, I just thought it would fade. When the point was made to me, and, and, and this is where I do think I am probably guilty of making an assumption, is that it, it, the, the culture and the language um, and the democratic values and the fact that, you know, we have all these ties, commercial and all the rest of it, yes, you know, w- will override that as you all, you know, the people that are coming, you all become... Americans and Americans are, and Brits have a good, mostly a good history. So yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like I said, I reflect upon it long and hard. Sorry, I, I, I jumped no, in no, before no. you. Sorry. It's it's an important question. Uh, I'll quote back one of your prime ministers: "Europe was created by history. America was created by philosophy." Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> yeah. um, and I actually do think it's important because I think what you're bringing is a more European model of thinking about migration, whereas. Yes, we could have a substantial part of our population from the global south, but you actually don't see the push for better relations with a Mexico or with a Guatemala or uh, maybe outside of Puerto Rico, which is a U.S. Cuba. territory, so it's a little <laughs> bit different. Yeah, Cuba, um, because a lot of our expat population is here specifically because they didn't like life um, where they were. Yeah. And also, um, and this is critically critical, which is that for some reason I you know we can debate it all day long but because our nation for lack of a better word does assimilate people better and acculturate them more to our values I think yeah. because of the Thatcher quote that that just won't be as much of a problem because you already see this in what Latinos after two or three generations identify as like white Hispanic, which is a meaningless term. But what do they really (laughs) mean by that is they're like, no, I'm not like Mexican. Like I'm not from Mexico. I don't have any connection to Mexico or Guatemala, Nicaragua, uh, you know, wherever, Venezuela, wherever. Uh, Same thing. I mean, look, like you said, I'm Indian. Like if anything, you know, a large Indian population in the U.S. should have antipathy towards the U.K. But instead, what is it? It's like, no, we have... Uh, but deeply acculturated in like a Western quasi Asian um, structure. And the culture that we want to perpetuate is one very much aligned, you know, in terms of keeping the Anglo sphere together. So, yeah, I think I you guys have been, yeah, it's hard, you've it's hard been to be much describe. more successful at, yeah. um, at, at, at creating, um, um, uh, you know, very broad brush Americans. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, right. obviously, you know, there's Italian Americans and there's this Americans, and then everybody loves, you know, playing up uh, that. But um, yeah, I don't think we we have been quite as successful as you, and I certainly think in some one of some of the European countries, notably France, um, it, it's been really quite a failure. Um, they are much more divided. I mean, you know, we we have serious issues here, but. Um, you know, it's funny. I always see that, you know, the French and Germans always think that racial problems in America are terrible. I'm not going to say that, but I'm like, have you seen, looked around your own country? I'm like, <laughs> I'm sorry. Like you have second class citizens who sometimes are not even citizens walking around. Germans only, um, you could only become, it's only changed, I think 10 years ago. Right. The, the bloodline, you know, you could have a Turkish family that had been there three generations, the kids born there. Not Germany. It only changed about 10 years ago. Right. I mean, I've been to Belgium, Antwerp, all these places. I mean, we were talking a literal segregated society. And I'm like, that is just simply like not the case whatsoever here in the U.S. Yeah. Um, hey, I hijacked your podcast. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. no, no, no I, I think people enjoy this. Marshall, you can, you can go ahead. Go. Yeah. So what's, um, we're, we're in our last Europe. bit here, but I, I want to focus on the point you made around migration. Because what's interesting is, if you're looking at the Biden administrations, and this is going to tick off right wing listeners, but the Biden administration has been decently aggressive on questions of migration, um, whether it was the Haitians who tried to cross into the country and in many ways did cross into the country, if it was continuing in spirit, if not letter, many of Trump's policies. And you saw a lot of actual anger within Biden's base over those decisions. And I think part of what's driving the direction that Biden is going is the fact that, to your point, if the caravans are getting bigger, this isn't just this, we can't just treat this. So think of, think, I don't know how much you know about US domestic politics of immigration. I mean, you actually, you wrote a book called The Age of Wall, so I expect you have something decently here. But if you look at the 1986 immigration reform that Ronald Reagan did, that was basically built around the idea that, hey, we're going to make everyone legal. This is this one-time thing. Yeah. No one who's aware of these issues thinks of any of these isolated incidents, thinks of any type of legislation as just a one-off policy. You are not going to be able to do that because like you said, whether or not your reasoning is climate change, whether or not your reasoning is just the fact that folks want to migrate to wealthy countries, that's I think of the way that a conservative listener who cringes at climate change discussion should think yeah, of this. Yeah, you, you, you could, you could get there, you could get there however you want to get there. Yeah. Um, though I'm partial to the climate change one. How should wealthy states mm -hmm. think of these policies? Because my last bit here is, I saw a lot of folks who were angry at the way the Biden administration handled the Haitian migrants, yeah. people on the left. And the question is, if this isn't just a one-off issue, so if this isn't just like there's this one-time thing where there are these migrants here and maybe we could be a little more lenient and maybe we could just be opening, but if we are perpetually going to see these type of migrations, how should you actually approach and handle that? Because Biden clearly lacks the language. Because this is goes, they they definitely the thing they most certainly screwed up was they had no language that could placate any side of these things. It is one of the biggest issues of the century um, because it hasn't peaked. I'll give you a stat. I'm not a demography expert, but the modeling says there are 1.2 billion Africans at the moment. 2060, 2.4 billion. I mean, it's incredible growth, but it's exponential. So I ask people, do you think Africa can create 1 billion jobs in 40 years? And all the professors that they're going to need, and all the doctors and the nurses and the roads to build the new towns and create the 1 billion jobs. And then, you know, surely no one's going to think, yeah, of course they are. You know, there's lots of boom towns in Africa, there's lots of good news stories in Africa, but if you look at it in the round, they ain't going to create a billion jobs. So the proportion of people that are already moving is going to grow. I'd go, you know, I'm not making a moral judgment against people for moving. I mean, even kind of understand, we've got pictures today of guys from the Middle East throwing rocks at the Polish police at the Belarusian border and trying to break through the fence. I don't agree with that behaviour, but I completely understand it. So, 
given that it's not a one-off, and given that if you think, oh, well, okay, we'll let this 4,000 do, you're going to get 8,000 next time, and then 16, et cetera, et cetera. And then when you're talking to people who, who have a sort of open borders mindset, you must say, well, okay, you have to give me your figure. You know, is it 10 million extra people or is it 40 million? What is it? And once we arrive at that figure, and of course they never will give you a figure, but once you arrive at it, right, now tell me all the houses you're going to build, how you're going to pay for it, what the taxation policies are for these extra 5 million, et cetera, et cetera. And they don't have the answer. So for me, the answer is uh, an investment program, targeted smart investment that would dwarf that one you and I came up with after the Second World War, Marshall. Absolutely dwarf the Marshall Plan. Just, you know, but that's what's required. Now, it's no good just throwing the money at, at some governments, some of whom are just utterly corrupt, kleptomaniacs. In some cases, you're going to have to know, all right, we're going to lose 10%, it's going to go in the back pocket, whatever. But a targeted, smart investment program that you actually mean not one you just declare in your sonorous voice at your speech at the end of the conference, but one you mean and then deliver. You know, trillions. And you create the conditions in the places people are coming from that means they don't want to move. It's, for me, it's the only way because we're going to, the populations apparently are going to keep rising until around about 2080. Now, there is some modeling that says it starts to decline, but hey, that's 60 years away. You know, we are talking about massive movement of peoples, and then the knock-on effects onto the politics. I, I fear that Europe uh, has not yet peaked in its... its um, I'm not talking about right of centre, I'm talking right wing. I'm talking people with opinions that I absolutely loathe. You know, I'm not talking about the Conservative Party or the Republican, just out-and-out bad racist people. And I worry that the more there is of this movement, the stronger they will become. So... And, and, just to, and, just Marshall, to, Marshall and just well, and, and just to pick up on what you just said, and Sagar, I think you'll take us out. Basically, it's and I'm saying this to Democratic left of center listeners. It's so important that you think about what Tim is saying, and you have some articulation of what it actually is. You have because once again, like, and this is, I, I like your example of citing the what is the number mm. of folks that you let in, because it also gets the fact that attendant to that number. Whatever number they would probably, let's say you could force through like intellectual honesty to get a number, there'd be almost no process of getting democratic, small d democratic buy into that number. There would be no language that would be actually set to say, hey, this is, there's no plebiscite. There's not going to be a, a, a vote for that number. So by definition, that number would have to be either placed top down through like administrative procedures. There's no Senate vote in the US for that. So it's actually just a deeply important project that the center left, people who see themselves as pro-migration, people who don't like family separation policies, people who think that Hungary and Poland are being too harsh, they're, high, they're entitled to that opinion, but they have to have a counter. I'm not expecting them to have an actual number, but they have to have an articulation of why are the 4,000 Haitians we're letting in? Why are they not going to lead to the 10, 16, 20 spiral that you just gave? Because I think that's where the good faith criticism of the policy comes in on. Well, they don't have an answer. I mean, I'll just, I'll call them out here. And this is where Howard Zinn just infects the minds of so many of these people, which is, oh, well, this one time the U.S. intervened in Haiti in like 1789. And, you know, uh, because of this, like that means that they have a special and they make this argument about every single Latin American country at the global south. Then they'll move on to Africa. I mean, I posed this question before to them. I was like, look, I, you know, I feel terrible that there are women who are domestically abused, but the standard that they would set under their asylum policy is that anybody who claims a domestic abuse could enter the United States. That's a billion people. I'm not, like, as you said, Tim, you know, we can have compassion, we could try and combat that, but to say that you should let in three times the U.S. population under a technical entry requirement is completely insane. And their inability in order to have that 
hard conversation is ultimately what is going to doom them. And Tim, as you are saying, is going to lead to the revanchism of some actual racism. Like we have not seen that in European politics in quite a long time. And it is coming. I mean, not even coming, it is here. Um, it will be there on an even bigger stage given what's happening right now in Belarus um, and Poland, which is not on the radar of Americans at all. But I, I like wow. to think that, that we're a couple of years downstream from you guys. Like Brexit happened, that was a preview of Trump. Um, the, Euro the European migrant crisis, very much a preview of our immigration debates. Um, in 2000, you know, 16th terrorism, even, you know, we are lagging kind of behind you. I think we're going to be there in a couple of years. And yeah, I would, I would take I'll, I'll, Yeah, let me, I'm not even running out of time. You react to that and then we'll, we'll get out of here. Yeah. Angela Merkel in 2015, 2016, when a, a million refugees and migrants, I mean, many of them genuine refugees, many of them economic migrants, arrived in Europe, one million in a period of a, a couple of weeks. It's like, and yeah. she said, we can do this. And she told all the other European Union countries, you'll have this many, you'll have this many. And most of them said no. Six years on, as more people are now arriving in various places, and last week in the UK, we had a 1,000 people cross the channel by small boats um, from France. Europe is now saying, we can't do this. And Fortress Europe is clanging shut the gates. And of course, on the left, and sometimes I am over there on the left. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm mostly in the center. But over there on, on the left, the, the the voices decrying this and saying, open the doors, uh, have a different policies. They're very loud, but there's really not many of them. It's not front and center anymore. Right. The issues have already gone so far that Europe is now saying, for better or worse, it's hardened its heart. And um, that's why, you know, if, if you want to have an open heart, don't just roll over and have your tummy tickled and say everybody can come because you're not going to win this argument. Start and win the argument of helping in a way that has never been done before. But that's going to take our countries and your right of centre, not you personally, your right of centre in America, to start buying into, load up that foreign aid, help. Yeah. It's a great place to end. Tim, thank you so much for joining. Um, a lot of great books are referenced today. They will all be available in the bookshops. And uh, thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks, Sam. Thanks very much, guys. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.